That's so cool. That's probably enough drink for tonight. That's so cool. It's going to be amazing. That's so cool. Probably enough drinks for tonight. That's probably enough drinks for tonight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another live stream. We are live on Twitch and on YouTube today. Um, 
I am uh, glad you joined us. And so we should be seeing uh, a few more folks here join today. We're, of course, going to be talking about MySQL. Um, you know, it's uh, near and dear to my heart. I've worked with MySQL for 20 years now. Um, and I'm joined today by Wayne and uh, Vaybov, uh, who are here to talk to us about some of the awesome things they're doing in the MySQL space. Um, we're going to hear about MySQL auditing and um, how you can set up MySQL in production to be successful. Um, and we're going to be taking questions um, and uh, seeing what people have to say. So um, welcome, Wayne and uh, Vaybov. Uh, how are you guys today? Doing great. How are you? Great. Great. Doing great, man. Hope you're doing good. Yeah, yes, I'm well. So um, maybe if if we can start uh, with, with you, Wayne, um, maybe give us a little introduction about you. Um, I know you have spoken at you know several conferences. We were just at the Open Source Summit. You did yours virtual. I was there in person. You did a talk there. Maybe give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been with my been playing with MySQL since version three uh, as a hobby database, and then um, professionally about the last fifteen years. Mm. Um, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, or Powell, Ohio, wherever you want to call it. We're just outside of Columbus, a stone's throw away. I got a wife. And, two kids and six cats and two dogs and i'm just a great big old nerd uh, uh, technology yeah. is is what i love well that and metal music i'm definitely a metal music fan so uh that's me too of... me too okay oh, so, nice. so so what are you listening to now so today i was listening to arch enemy uh, okay before we fired up so i had to turn that down because it's a little extreme, um, but um, it's one of my favorites. Any metal genre, that's what I listen to. I love it. Really? Okay. Well, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, great. And that's something we do have in common. I'm a, I'm a big uh, yeah. nerd and love to go to uh, metal shows whenever I can. But generally, I have to go alone because no, but my wife doesn't like it. So, you know. You know, I've got one coming up on the 27th of November. First one I've been to since the pandemic. And it's a band called Ginger out of the Ukraine. Oh, and my okay. wife is going. And I intend on being inside that mosh pit the whole time. Oh, so so Wayne goes moshing and MySQLing. In a yes. Day. So, yes. so it is, it is a both with dedication and passion. Yes. Great. W Wayne, thank you for joining us. And uh, Vaybov, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So my name is Vaybov, and I'm working for, um, I'm working as a, uh, DBA lead and production support engineering team for the company called uh, TechMojo. And uh, really excited to be here and using MySQL since almost like nine, 10 years, or maybe a little more than that. So, yeah, uh, really excited to be here. So, we probably started about the same time. So, um, were, were, you a, were you a MySQL 3. Dot something something guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, 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 that's when I started way back in the days. Yeah. Okay. Good to yeah. know. So, um, hey Bob, why don't we start with you? You wanted to talk to us a little bit about, you know, your <clears throat> experience in running MySQL in production. So um, I figured it would be a really good place to start. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, your experience and tell us, you know, some of the things we should look out for. Okay. So um, as we all know, like, you know, MySQL uh, is a, is a, the most popular open source, um, you know, database that uh, people frequently use across the globe and starting from, you know, smallest application to the big, biggest application or product that we are using on a day to day basis. So uh, and there are there are certain things uh, when we use and, uh, you know, MySQL in production, especially uh, there are certain things which uh, I would like to highlight that, you know, uh, folks who are starting their career as a DBA, maybe or maybe they have just started using MySQL. Uh, uh, can uh, maybe these tips will be useful for them hopefully and um, so a couple of things like you know there are certain basic settings when we use mysql on linux or uh, ubuntu or any uh, uh, you know uh, operating system so uh, apart from the, the core with the core thing is like you know installation and configuration on the on the very basic fundamental manner uh, wherein uh, certain os level settings that needs to be taken care for example uh, open file limits, uh, uh, which is which plays a very huge part when 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 you have a lot of concurrency on for your application, uh, so that has to be taken care uh, uh, very well. 
uh, the safest uh, bet would be for that setting is you know set as higher as possible rather than just setting it to 1024 uh, so, so is there any downside to that though if you set it too high have you run into any problems if it's set too high though uh yeah so i mean uh, uh the, there are downside of it uh you know you land up uh you know uh consuming more resources and uh but yeah uh, uh there is no uh there is no a uh, right value for that it depends upon your workload of your application and as in when you play with that setting and uh, you know then you decide whether you want to go with five thousand fifty thousand five lakh or, or in some cases you know even higher than that so it it typically depends upon the workload of the application yeah so one of that uh, uh, one of the setting is that uh, another setting i would uh, you know suggest or uh, would like to talk about is swappiness uh, which is uh, another really important uh, i would say uh, setting for the production at least um, by the way i'm just uh, talking about production but it applies everywhere uh, it depends upon how heavy you are using whether it is your production environment or your lower environment so uh, swappiness, uh, swappiness is something that uh, one should be because by default it comes with the 60 right and uh, and and you land up eating uh, memory if you are uh, if you are your your application is very heavy in terms of concurrency so uh, again there is no it depends for every setting there is no uh, every setting will not have a specific right value it really depends how your overall uh, architecture and overall your application is behaving the your the way the database has been consumed so let's say setting up with the lower value maybe to start with 15 or 20 you know and then gradually to go towards five and maybe towards even lower than five uh but not zero for sure because once you go there then there is no you know you you're not having that room to uh, get attention of the problems uh, yeah so, yeah, and, and for, for those who might not be aware of what swappiness is, it's uh, telling the operating system how much uh, memory to reserve for uh, file system cache and, and other things. So you're not able to necessarily access or use all of the memory as efficiently as the database would like. So uh, sometimes setting that uh, too high can cause some issues. Yep. And so, uh, hey, Bob, it, it, you know, when, when you're talking about some of these settings, right, so making sure that, you know, the system is set up, um, I, I think that there's a lot of very, um, you know, basic things that you should go through. And, and I'm curious, do you see um, a lot of similar issues over and over again that, you know, maybe your developers deploy some new applications and they kind of fall into the same patterns of, you know, oh, they missed this thing um you know are, are there certain things you, you you tend to see uh quite often uh yeah uh but as in uh, you know especially uh you know you see a lot of this kind of issues uh, on the forum as well where you know user come across and you know this kind of challenges where uh, okay we are having performance issue uh, that's a general statement right and when you try to dig down you find uh, things are going wrong at a lot of places and one of the common uh thing which i've observed is is memory the way the memory has been consumed mm. uh, by the database, by the, you know, indirectly by the application. So, uh, yes, I mean, I come across a lot, uh, uh, but as and when I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, contribution from the forums and, you know, people learn a lot, learn lot from the Percona forum as well. I'm sure anybody who is a MySQL DBA will be hugely relying on Percona forums and tools and the ecosystem that Percona has built. So yeah, we learn a lot uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, and and we face, uh, you know, quite frequently these kind of issues, uh, which are revolves around the memory. Okay, okay. And um, is it because, um, you know, maybe developers are not using indexes, their queries are kind of bad? I mean, like, what is there? Is there like a common theme that you continually see? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, uh, it happens, especially on the lower environment. It happens a lot. Uh, we try to restrict it to the lower environment uh, as much as possible. So we learn from that and we ensure that we reward those things. So, yeah, sometimes like, you know, indexes are missing. Uh, sometimes you're joining different tables and having different character sets and not using the efficient index. Um, uh, sometimes you're using the wrong index. Uh, so uh yeah i i face these kind of challenges quite frequently 
uh, but uh, as i said you know as in when we learn we look back uh, some of the things when you face this kind of issues based on your past learning you land up checking those things first to ensure okay this is this is the this is something which is already taken care and now i have to look for next problem where it is uh, exactly to trace down where is the exact issue so yeah i mean uh, quite a lot uh, missing indexes not using proper indexes not at all having the indexes yeah those are always tough ones because you know it 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 seems to me and this is maybe this is just the theme that i'm going through in the moment um i've been really trying to push database design matters more than you might think lately uh, because a lot of people that I've been talking to, uh, whether it's on meetups like this or on my podcast, um, you know, the, the, the system, you know, as you kind of mentioned, there are some certain settings, whether it's the number of uh, open files or it's the swappiness or, you know, you're talking about configuration parameters like the InnoDB uh, buffer pool size or things like that. Those are very common. And once you have a good DBA team, they, they can dial those in for a lot of applications and they can tweak things as need to be. Um, but I, I keep on hearing over and over again that, um, you know, code gets deployed that hasn't been properly tested. It, it you know, hasn't gone through um, the, 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 the process of getting vetted. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, for, for that, it's something that we see quite often is, you know, you can, you can plan for, you know, the knowns, but that code deployments, new releases, uh, those types of things, they tend to cause more issues than you might think. True. And I don't know if you experienced that as well. Yeah, yeah, a lot. It's a real world <laughs> out there. So uh, uh, even at times, like, you know, um, uh, for uh, as you rightly mentioned, right? I mean, you know, people are testing. Uh, you are in a uh, hurry of releasing new features for the product, for the, for the, for the application. Um, at times, you face this kind of challenges when you are having a bug fixes also right uh, you want to fix certain bugs but you forget about you know thinking from the performance side and then hopefully when you test those things on the lower environment testing environment and you know and having a good dba team around they can trace that uh, if you have tested well and if you have reviewed it well if you don't then you will land up having unpleasant surprises on production <laughs> of course right that's always a challenge yeah it's always a challenge Wait, I was going to say something. I, yeah, I, saw, um, I, I saw him start to move. Do you find that there is a disconnect between the developer community and the DBA teams? A, a large disconnect where there's not a lot of communication that goes on between the two. And those problems on the back end from the database and the application point of view could have been resolved earlier if there was more communication between the app developers and the DBA teams. The question is for me. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I do find. However, at the same time, I feel that this gap is getting reduced day by day. As in more, as a DBA, you involve uh, uh, not only uh, you know uh, communicating frequently with them for the issues, but also uh, things which they don't know. You try to educate them uh, and try to share your knowledge. Uh, in terms of how you are solving these issues, maybe not directly related to them, maybe something which is internal to the, you know, a more uh, core towards the DBA part, but still you try to share. And as in when that, uh, you know, uh, I think if I look back five years back, uh, the, you know, this gap was very huge. And when I presently, when I look, uh, when I think about this gap, it's, it's, it's getting reduced and, uh, and and they are more aware about now but the key is the communication how we as a dba team uh, how i'm solving those issues as in when i'm uh, finding it so that they ensure that this is not repeated in the next uh, release even you know uh, uh, for the for the any other uh, application or module so yeah uh, we try to have a common knowledge base and a communication as frequently as possible so we share our knowledge and how we have fixed these issues so yeah uh, we land up so we land up uh, you know experiencing new issues than repeating the same old ones so it, that's an interesting point because um i i've seen a couple of different things so the longer teams work together i think the easier it becomes right so if if you've been working with uh, a, a a core group of dbas and developers who have started to build those connections um you know you definitely can get some 
you know, good scale and you can start to rely and kind of teach each other. But I keep on seeing more and more. I mean, I, I think I saw the average tenure of a developer is less than two years at a company. It's like 18 months, which means that they move stuff into production and they never see like potentially the first update to it, um, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Um, and I, I mean, you know, Wayne, you know, to, to your question, I've seen um, a, a bit of the opposite when it comes to like some of these newer companies, especially when you have that high turnover. Um, a lot more companies are starting to move away from having dedicated DBA teams even. And uh, you end up having, you know, uh, maybe an SRE who's responsible for the entire stack um, it isn't necessarily just a database expert, right? And so uh, that becomes even more challenging because, you know, the, the pressure for a lot of startups uh, is turn the code around, turn the code around, release, 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 release. Um, and it just happens so much, so fast. Um, a lot of times things just get thrown over the wall. In fact, uh, I've talked to several people who I, I said, you know, hey, what's the biggest problem that you guys face? And they go, developers. I mean, that's, that's just the first thing that they say, developers, right? Like, and it's like, well, is it really developers or, in, well, we never see the code before it goes to production um, or we don't have a say in whether that code can go to production. So it might be really a poor design um, and it just kind of gets thrown over. And what, what's your experience there, Wayne? Same thing. It's the same exact thing. There's no communication between the DBA teams and the application mm -hmm. teams. There is a segment of duties, the, DB, the application teams, they design their tables, they design the database, they do all the, the fun work in the back end, but without consulting a DBA, they move it into you know, their development environment and it starts to fall apart. They then reach out as a fire drill to the DBA team going, oh, it's, it's not working the way we want it. You know, we, we got to go prod tomorrow and we're seeing all of these issues and you know, that six months of development, a DBA was never involved. Well, so at least you got them to move it to test. There's a lot of people who do continuous integration deployment and deploy immediately into production and stuff now, um, which I've seen that cause immense problems as well, right? Um, but yeah, I, I feel your pain um, because I've seen that quite a bit as well, where, um, you know, you, you do have that, especially... Um, with more diverse groups. I think if, you know, ideally you want to be tightly coupled with the development teams, but um, I keep on seeing, um, and I don't know, Vapov, if, if you've got a lot of development teams you support, if you've got a smaller, you know, like groups, I mean, there, there's some companies who might have thousands of applications and each one has a different development team and there might be like 10 DBAs to support thousands of developers, right? Which is like, how do you do that? You know, how do you get those scales? So um, I don't know. Have, are, is your do, do you have fewer uh, applications development teams that you're working with, or are you like really spread out? Uh, no, uh, I would say like you know uh, around about uh, fifty uh, developers team uh, okay. versus doing three DBA uh, three okay. DBAs. Yeah. So yeah, you're getting some pretty good scale there as well. You know, yeah. um, and I know Wayne, your environment's pretty big and complica complicated with all kinds of different, you know, systems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the other thing that I see, and I don't know if, if both of you are seeing this as well, when we're talking about production and we're talking about databases, um, I'm seeing more companies just end up with non-standardized technologies, right? So, um, you know, and, and again, this is this this is a lot to do with how organizations are set up, but it could be, you know, this team only wants to deploy MySQL community. This team wants to deploy Percona server. This team wants to deploy MySQL enterprise. This team wants to use MongoDB. This team wants to use something completely different. And, you know, like they all kind of like fight. And, you know, Wayne, as you said, sometimes it's like, this has to go into production tomorrow. And you're kind of stuck with some of those choices sometimes. That's true. And I know one of the things that I like to do where at all possible is set down that base set of standards. This is the version that we're using of MySQL or Percona server. These are the versions that we're using. These are the support teams that will support you. Um, these are the standards that we've designed around the, you know, the OS, the basic database configuration and let them take that and go with that 
and then build the wrap around it. So at least if the DBA team is you know getting 18 new servers in the next two days, they're going to know that those 18 servers are going to be built the exact same way at the OS level, at the MySQL configuration level. And then if they start hitting problems, they can start adjusting per the MySQL that might need to be adjusted, but also work with those application developers and go, hey, you've got this query and it's pulling back 200 million rows, but you don't have any indexes. Yeah. Well, let's look at an index here to speed things up for you. Yeah. Anyway, so we, we kind of went off into a little side tangent there. And, and babe, I wanted to finish, you know, like some of your tips and tricks for, you know, getting your system ready for production. So we talked a little bit about a few settings. Um, but as as your applications are getting deployed, as you're having conversations with your development teams or other DBAs, what are some of the other critical things that you're looking at to make sure that are set up uh, to make sure that they have a smooth sailing and success when they deploy? Right. So, uh, uh, as uh, Wayne, uh, you know, uh, rightly pointed out, basically to have a, um, there are two, three areas where we try to focus, basically, uh, especially when uh, rolling out any, uh, you know, deployments or uh, anything, um, you know, new database server or anything. So, one, two, as Wayne, you know, uh, rightly said, to have a production standard, uh, which, uh, which you have set. Uh, irrespective uh, of anything there are certain standards which are in general like which we follow uh, like as I mentioned like you know whether it is happiness whether it is open um, you know uh, open file limit um, there are certain really small things like for example having a systat installed on the OS right you want to ensure that you are having one minute interval uh, SAR report uh, not completely relying on your GUI monitoring tool but at times you are just logged in there and you don't want to switch your window to see what is happening on the CPU, uh, just to check on the monitoring. So these are, these are really minute, small things, but we try to follow those production standards across, mm -hmm. whether it is for database, even it is for the application servers, uh, right? So, you know, this kind of thing. So another thing also to ensure, like, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, smooth deployment or, you know, um, rolling out a new database, or rolling out new features, new applications, we ensure that there are three aspects that we try to focus very closely. One is proper sizing uh, or choosing the hardware, uh, not overly spent, not underspent, um, uh, using the right version uh, when it comes to MySQL, you know, uh, we obviously, uh, you know, 5.6 5 end of life cycle, but again, you know, at least have minimum 5.7. Uh, having basic configuration really right, whether it is, uh, you know, related to spreading out your binary logs versus your data directory in a different partition to have a balanced IO, uh, whether it is having a, uh, ensuring it is under the monitoring, uh, uh, by the way, we use PMM. Uh, uh, so, you know, ensuring that it is there and, <laughs> right. And that's the best tool that we have, honestly, in open source, uh, undoubtedly. So, um, uh, yeah, and ensuring, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we are having at least bare minimum testing. You can't really simulate your production load, uh, you know. So having a bare minimum, uh, you know, testing in place, ensuring the new uh, maybe stored procedures or queries are reviewed by the DBAs, uh, DBA team. Okay. Ensuring. So let's say you you maybe land up, we maybe land up having 100 things which is deploy which are going to deploy in the in the next deployment uh, but we try to ensure out of these what are the most frequently used uh, you know uh, calls or a feature okay. or, or or a query that we know this will be called multiple times for every single call this will going to hit so we try to focus on that top 5 top 10 and we ensure that okay uh, you know indexes are in place what is the size of that table that you're going to call how frequently you're going to write this table or how frequently you're going to read this table. Is this table needs a design change because you are going to introduce this new feature, right? Uh, we try to take care of all these things, but not completely. We try to bucket it into, a, 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 as I said, like, you know, what are your top 10 calls in this deployment? Like, you know, top 10 heavy items. It may be a small change, but we know this will going to impact in a big way. Even if it goes, even, you know, something goes wrong it will going to blast so that's how we try to take care of it and 
again, once we deploy those things, we try to analyze it over the period of few days, uh, three, four, five days, one week to understand the pattern and to compare using, you know, uh, PT query digest, to be honest, uh, we use it very frequently, which really helps us to understand how we are versus, you know, uh, how we were before okay. the deployment. So, so, so you're, you're you're deploying standard configurations or trying to stick to a standard configuration, and then you're yeah. keep on iterating even when in production you're checking for those those changes on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's always a good advice, and I think it's undervalued sometimes that you know just because things worked yesterday doesn't mean they're going to work today. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think that 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 is a very good you know thing and i have a story that i could tell later on about that and i'm, I'm working on a, on a on a on a on a presentation on like real life anecdotes that can teach us good design principles um so so stay tuned for that one um but uh sure. you know, yeah. so so i'm curious are you using anything for your configurations like you know are you using um you know either uh like, like an ansible or you know chef or puppet or you know um are you doing anything kubernetes related yet or is this just kind of like you just have a standard configuration you deploy you kind of build from scratch uh no uh at this point we are building from scratch uh okay. but uh, um in you know we will be, we'll be going to uh moving to uh ansible uh in the okay. future like in, in few months uh but at this point it is manual and uh and and we have fixed our uh, most of the issues uh, which revolves around uh, either capacity or or whether it terms of you know configurations uh, which we have learned from our past mistakes as i mentioned um, you know uh, uh, smallest thing biggest thing uh, what should be your buffer pool what should be your you know uh, what should be your trx commit settings what should be your isolation level so all these things based on our past experience we have learned and we have standardized those uh, configuration so we know at least on these areas we will not be having these issues we'll be more than happy to deal with new issues to learn new, new things and right. that's how it goes oh, good good now one of the other things um that we have to get right and that has to be standard is security best practices and that's why wayne's here today to talk to us about one of those really critical things which is auditing so, audit logging auditing yes so so wait why should i use audit logging why yeah, shouldn't why? you use well, audit logging yes it can be a great forensics tool to dig through you know if you've got queries acting awry you can kind of see how often they're going but it can be a better forensic tool that if data starts disappearing mysteriously or users start disappearing mysteriously, or passwords start getting changed, and you don't know where it's coming from, use of the audit log will give you a forensic tool to help you narrow down where that's coming from. And it will help you home into who potentially even done it. And then you can go dig from there as to why they would have done it. We live in a world with the data is so important now that if you don't have some kind of data auditing on, you could potentially be doing yourself a disfavor. Um, I recently had a, a situation where if it weren't for the audit log, we would have taken days longer to figure the issue out. Um, and that was just, it was incredible that we could just find it as quickly as we did and then put it to sleep. Um, so I hadn't been at that point a big proponent of it, but I am now. Um, just because one incident that really laid it in my mind and how important knowing what's happening to our data really is. Um, I know a lot of folks who do use auto logging, they pretty much just turn the auto logging over to their audit and compliance side of the house and let them deal with it. And they don't look at it. They don't they just say, okay, here, you, you wanted it. So now you can have it. Um, I think it can be used for a little bit more than that. And I think people should, especially if they have important data that, you know, they don't need to, you know, see disappear or they need to keep a consistency check on. And auto logging is great for that. So, so there's, really, there's really kind of three things, though, from an audit perspective. You know, you mentioned like, you know, the kind of the troubleshooting aspect of it, something weird has happened. So how do we do that? The compliance aspect's another one that you alluded to there um, as well, right? So right. You, you've got 
you know, that, that compliance and let's be honest, every big company now is all in on security and compliance and you can't, you can't do anything without having security and compliance kind of like, you know, uh, checked off. Um, but I think that uh, may, maybe like the third one of that, that kind of like, you know, tricycle, if you will, um, is, um, you know, really just about understanding some of the patterns that are happening that might give you a bit more insight or observability into what's happening, right? So, you know, you can troubleshoot those problems or, you know, security breaches, you can have the compliance issue for compliance. But I think that, you know, some of those patterns aren't necessarily obvious until you start to see them and say like, why is somebody doing this on a regular basis? Why are they changing these tables like every week? Why are they doing these things? Um, you know, you start to see some of those kind of weird ones. Agreed. Agreed. And if you can start to narrow those down, you can definitely get control of the situation a little bit faster. Um, let me, um, so, you know, I wanted to talk about the whys. And I think we covered the whys, Great. but we could go deeper into the whys, but let's, let's go ahead and turn it on. How, you know, how I would go about turning it on and then look at how we can actually parse data. You going to screen share, that. Wayne? You're going to screen yes, share? I am. I'm oh. a big fan of, um, of interactive. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and move us to the bottom so Wayne can get his, his screen going. His screen okay. on. Or maybe we'll move us to the side. I never I never know with this setup where it's going to get the best screen. Okay. So should see my desktop, well, my Raspberry Pi console. All righty. So okay. there you go. All right. So this is my little Raspberry Pi um, production server that I use here at home. This little guy does everything for me. Um, when I enable audit logging, I, I like to do it while my SQL is off. I will enable the audit logging plugin. I like to set um, to, to JSON for the output. And then I like to use JQ to parse that output. It gives me more flexibility to parse it in that manner. Um, changing the format of your audit log is not dynamic. You can enable the audit log. Um, while MySQL is running, but you can't change it to another file format. And, and by that, um, this server is running 5.7 because I can't build 8.0 on a, a um, Raspberry Pi just yet. So these are, the, these are typically what I use when I put together a box for myself or, you know, for a customer who may come to me and go, hey, how about some best practices? And these are no by by no way the gospel. Um, I think one that is overlooked a lot is the ability to make this plugin permanent. I don't want somebody to go out and disable that plugin. Mm, yeah, yeah. Delicious yeah. things, and then re-enable it. So this one is, is, is really key. Um, another thing that I like is, that, like I said, I do want to par parse it with JSON. I prefer to parse it with JSON. Easier to read, easier to dig through, easy to query against. Now, now, Wayne, are you loading that JSON anywhere else, like whether it's Elastic or OpenSearch, depending on, you know, um, installed or um, any other tools? So we would, you know, in, in a bigger situation, I would definitely recommend it would be dumped someplace else where it could be queried. Um, easier than command line querying that I'm going to do here. Um, so I know that a lot of companies that I've dealt with, they are dumping it into like a data lake where they can then start digging through it, uh, which is, I think is actually a great thing. Yeah. And I'm sure that, um, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, the compliance team, giving them just raw JSON probably like makes them scratch their heads. So. Yes, it does. It does. So we dump it into a manner that they can get to it and an easy query from it instead of having to pull their hair out. Um, I've actually seen some compliance teams that I've interacted with, they're actually about writing their own tools to parse through the JSON data themselves. I think it just depends on the the, the level of skill level and the compliance exactly. team, right? you know? Um, exactly. So again, uh, these are, the, you know, these are the main ones I'm using. Uh, I pointed out the, you know, force permanent. We don't want it unloaded once we put it in. Um, I set a one gig size uh, before it will rotate to the next one. And then, you know, just for demonstration purposes, I just re retain four logs. Uh, in a production environment, you will probably have to retain much more than that. 
and you will have to probably, um, you know, have your compliance team tell you, hey, you've got to keep 30 days worth on the server and anything older than 30 days, you have to dump to our repositories that we can parse through it later if necessary. Uh, right. Just for a test environment here, I just kept it pretty straight and simple. And it's, you know, they, they rotate it one gigabyte of size. Um, you'll notice in here, you don't see any filtering. Yeah. I don't believe in filtering your audit log. You know, so are you worried that the size is going to get too big or that the, the potential impact on the server performance could you know hurt you? I have not seen it as an impact to the servers yet in any of our situations where we've had to say, oh, it's the audit log, let's turn it off. I haven't seen that to date. And we I've been involved with audit logging for at least eight years. And I've never so, seen a situation. So out of curiosity, and I, I think generally any sort of like logging, especially when you're logging things in mass, there's some overhead, right? It's of course a lot of times it's negligible, right? So five percent, seven percent, I've seen, you know, ten percent, depending on you know, somewhere in that range. Um, I, I think this gets back to a production best practice uh, that we didn't talk about, which is probably don't run your servers to the red line. <laughs> so if you're running at 80, 90% and you turn on audit logging, it probably could impact you. But if you're always running at, you know, 40 ish percent going to 45 or 46 probably isn't going to negligibly impact things. Agreed. And, and that's one of the things when I do speak with folks who want to do this, I'm like, you know, let's look at where your server is today. Yeah. Let's look at your performance. And if, if this is going to tip you over, it might not be the best idea. We might want to tweak some other things or look at some other items that we can, you know, pull your overall performance back a little bit before we add this in. Right. Um, and then again, filtering. Um, if you speak with folks who do audit and compliance as their primary job, they will tell you they don't want to see any filtering because filtering defeats the purpose. If you're filtering out a specific user ID, if you're specific, filter not specific tables, you're defeating the purpose of an audit log. Audit log needs to have a record of every transaction that goes on. And filtering out, not a best practice, should not be done. Because if you filter out a particular user ID, let's say you filter out the user ID you use for PML, and someone happens to get that user ID, they could start to do potentially malicious things with that ID. And if you're not capturing what that eye is doing, that he's doing, you might not find where something malicious is occurring. So yeah. Yeah. It's know, putting those blinders on then, right? Because exactly. You, Don't you know, put blinders on. If you're yeah. filtering, I mean, if you're auditing, audit. Don't filter. Audit everything. So, so this is the general um, idea of what I do um, in my test box and this for this demonstration. This is not gospel. Um, everyone would configure it a little differently. The things that I think should be gospel would be don't let it be unplugged and don't filter anything. Okay, so that, so Wayne's, Wayne's two commandments. Yeah, my two commandments are don't filter anything and don't set it up so you can disable it because you're just opening right. holes for yourself. Good advice to live by. Thank you. So this, this particular box of mine has been running for a bit, oh, one more thing. So when you make all these changes, you might see an F file, you will need to bounce your server, bounce your MySQL instance so they can get picked up. That's why I typically do things like this at the beginning of a server's life, or if it, someone comes in after the fact and goes, hey, we didn't enable this in the beginning, but we need it now. I might take a maintenance window to put these in and then restart the MySQL instance at that point so they can pick them all up. Um, I know that a lot of standard builds will have some sort of audit logging already put in it, ready to go when it comes out of Chef or Ansible or wherever it comes from. It will already be there. Um, and then, you know, if you're worried about you know, potential disk issues or disk, you know, give it its own file system. Give it its own file system. Let it do its thing over there, and then you don't have to worry about impacting the data file systems that are working heavy as well. So if you can segregate that out, I definitely recommend segregating that out just to keep that level of um, performance from being impacted. So this particular server, um, it's my it's my weather um, database. 
your weather database. So I have two weather here. stations, one that's okay. an Arduino, one that's a Raspberry Pi, and they feed this database. Um, so we're going to jump into. And you can see in here that I currently have, you know, one plus two others. Those two others were from for, were from reboots. So there's really not much in there. So we're going to look at this first one. We're going to do a quick little peek in it. And I'm going to use a combination of JQ, grep, and set to narrow down to a specific um, item that we want to look for. So let's say in this, in this first demonstration, um, let's say we want to look for inserts on a particular table or just all inserts that are occurring on the database. So I can run, well, that was the delete one. Sorry about that. Maybe change, maybe change that to insert. It's okay. Whenever there's lots of people watching, okay, it's, back it. up. it's a rule. It's a rule. You have to like, you know, have something where it's like, oh no, I can't. Right. Okay. So we're going to just pull on um, anything that was inserted uh, in this particular string that I got set up here. So as you can see, it filtered by all the insert statements that are in that particular log file. Um, so you can, you know, you can clearly see in here that, um, this one, uh, Matt, was hold over from my talk in Percona Live this year. Wow. I named the weather table Percona so that I would make sure that when I did my demos, I had the right data. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still there. It's still there and it's still being fed by my Arduino weather station. Um, and that's been up since April, chugging right along. So, again, you can see here, you know, all of the data that, that I've captured was just from the insert state and that in itself is you know you can get, you can get develop those patterns here you can develop what's going on here by looking at this um if you just wanted to look at the entire audit log without filtering it down um, it's really you know simple enough as just to do we had a request to in, increase the font size so i i switched our view here I don't okay. know if we'll be able to see the whole thing, but you know, we're, me... we're, uh, we, I, we, it's, it's a little easier to read now, I think. But uh, I can't remember what the. It's okay. I think we're okay, Wayne. Is it, okay. Wayne? There we go. Uh, I think it's the same, but <laughs> that's uh, okay. Change on my side. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. So if you just wanted to see everything within the audit log without any filtering, without any grepping, you could just do this, audit log, and pipe it to JQ. Did I spell my name wrong? Yes. Oh. And you could pipe it to JQ, and you can see everything that's going on. JQ is a great uh, JSON parser. A lot of tutorials, a lot of things written about how to bring data out. So, you know, if you want to go this route, you want to turn JSON on, um, JQ is a good parsing tool. There are other ones that are out there as well. Um, I'm a command line nerd, so I like to stay at the shell as much as I can. Um, not get into the GUI world if I don't have to. So I'll stay here, gather what I need. So this is, you know, that's pretty cool. We saw everything that we want. We've seen everything that goes on in the database. But let's let's do something that would be considered destructive. And for, for demonstration purposes, I put this horrible security hole back on last night. I put root at local holes back in so we could demonstrate with that one today what we're going to do to it. So everybody so, go hack Wayne's weather station. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have about two minutes to hack it. So hurry. So I'm going to do just a drop. Okay. 
I'm going to jump out and we're going to bring my audit log command that we were querying this up and I'm going to change it to, to look for drop. Yeah, we're, we're unfortunately because of the screen, we're kind of like not able to see what it was. Oh, can you throw up that command just again real quick? Yeah, just so people can see it. Yeah. Uh, because when we're down at the bottom, it cuts us off. So, yeah. Um, but, okay, there you go. So you can see right here um, that I, I updated the command to look for the word drop. And as you can see, my, the, the user root was dropped. Right, right. Now, now, Wayne, here's the thing, right? That's great that we can identify it. But if we had proper security, we should have prevented the drop from ever happening, right? Correct. If we have proper security, we prevent those drops from happening. Um, I was a privileged elevated user, so I could do that. Um, and I did it that way so we, that we could see this in the, you know, in the audit log that it was dropped um, and where it was dropped from. So the Pi user at the local host ran that drop statement. Um, and that's nice because you can actually say, oh, Johnny at, sir, you know, at client XYZ ran this statement at this particular time zone. Why? And you can right. go right back to the person who did it and yeah. find out, you know, what's going it, it's, on. It's one of the layers of defense, right? Yes. So, you know, you, you want to, this isn't a replacement for security practices that prevent those things from happening. It is, if they do happen, how do you find out who and how who do you go slap on the wrist? Exactly. And, you know, um, I know in some larger organizations, there are a lot of shared IDs that are supposed to be, you know, shared and they're supposed to have the proper level of security on them sometimes they might get set up incorrectly somebody might not verify what permissions they gave those shared ids that shared id might have the ability to change a password yeah so if if 16 people know the password to be john doe and then somebody comes in overnight and changes the password to jane doe now we've got nobody knows what it is except for that one person Right. We can yeah. jump in. We can see who did that because they had the rights to do it. We can see who did it. We can go back to them and go, okay, we need to change this back to John Doe because, you know, we don't know why you changed it to Jane Doe, but everyone knows it as John Doe. It's being used that way. Let's put it back. Makes sense. So, so those are the kind of, that's my, that's my song and dance for today. Just the, the ins and outs of it, why to turn on, why to use, and then how you can actually look at it. Um, I will follow this up with a more detailed blog post cool. about the next three weeks um, on the Percona Community blog. I'll follow it up with a detailed blog post so that um, people can get more information from it. That's great. That's great. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, everybody should have that thought process of uh, security in depth. Right. You know, you, you need to make sure, you know, not only do you have the things to catch them when they happen, it's like, you know, it, you know, it, it's just like performance tuning when, when, when you talk about this. Right. When the problem is happening, you want to fix it and you want to have the information to fix it. But ideally, you want to prevent the problem from ever happening in the first exactly. place. Right. Because once the problem is happening, once the servers are on fire, that's that's like, you know, hey, it's great if you can fix it. But you know, getting on fire in the first place is not a good idea. No, no. And this is just one way to help you put that fire out quicker if in case it does happen. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so we, we had a few comments, no questions so far, but <clears throat> we will throw out, um, happy birthday wishes. Um, uh, so we have, uh, uh, Ron Vijay is, uh, says October uh, 6th is his birthday. So happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. It just happens to be my anniversary today, 20th anniversary. So um, as well. So, you know, yay for me. Um, which is that's, that's a great milestone. Um, yes, it is. Um, and so uh, we also have uh, Veer um, totally wants to, you know, be part of Percona and work on the ExtraDB cluster operator and uh, Veer. Um, you know, I, I would encourage you to reach out, uh, you know, you can check out our careers page, or if you want to hit me up on uh, discord, I can connect you with the right people. Um, always, uh, looking to, uh, add people to the team. Um, we also have, uh, 
you know, a comment here. Um, question on the auto log native MySQL feature or Percona feature. It is a Percona feature. Um, you can get an audit log as part of MySQL Enterprise as well if you want to pay uh, for MySQL Enterprise. Just another good reason to use Percona Server because it's right there with it when you get it. Yes. And it's really helpful. All right. I don't see any other uh, except uh, some thanks for the birthday wishes um, from uh, Bangalore, which is always wonderful. But um, everyone... Thank you for coming today, Wayne and uh, uh, Vaibhav. I, I appreciate you stopping by. Hopefully, we can do this again sometime. You know, have have a bit of a, a conversation on things. Uh, love when we have um, you know people on talking about some interesting things they're doing, um, uh, and appreciate the anniversary wishes. Oh, um, oh, we have a question right up Wayne's alley. Oh, question right up so, Wayne's alley. So, um, IoT devices connected directly to MySQL. Um, I use um, Arduinos uh, for most of all of my connecting to MySQL from an IoT device. Um, there is a great set of libraries that are out there written by um, Chuck Bell. They are connector libraries for MySQL from the Arduino. So if you use a straight Arduino C code, you, you have them. Let me see if I can't grab that link real quick and drop it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, so that's interesting to connect directly from the devices. I, I, I wonder, I guess it depends on what sort of devices, if they're deployed in the field, could that potentially be a security risk? Um, do you want to go through a proxy, right? Do you want to go through some application middleware? So, I, in my initial talks, when I, when I've done this, um, one of my goals was to do away with that middleware in places where it was doable. And, you know, since all of my projects are internal to my network. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But Chuck Bell does have um, some security built into these drivers he has written. Okay. Matt, where do I paste that? Oh, um, there should be like a chat thing, shouldn't there? Like, I see the chat between us. Oh, well, if you put put it there, I can put it on the main. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, there there should be a chat. I don't know since I'm the the host here. Um, I I I get all kinds of super special access. Uh, but there, I just posted it yeah. in the, uh, the, so, the group chat there. So um, if you're looking to use, like I said, Arduino's. Um, to do it, you can do this by directly going to the database. Um, Chuck Bell has wrote some great connectors. Um, I've yet to reach out to him to see what his future plans are for more security. Actually, I probably should since I presented on this several times this year to see where he's going to go with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I've been using the the Adrenos for um, some devices and doing some some demo stuff, but I'm not going directly to any of the databases. I'm using that kind of like proxy layer where I've got a, um, a controller which intercepts whatever I'm doing on the, the devices and then translates it into what I want to do. Um, you know, so I, I, th I think that's, it, it just, I guess it's six, one, half a dozen, the other. But I also have to work with Postgres, Mongo, and MySQL. And uh, I, I'm part of my thing is um, I'm going to extend that to actually interact with AWS instances. So um, when you know you you know you get the, I think I got uh, I think I got one of the devices around here somewhere. Oh well, you can never have it just handy when you want it. But uh, basically, when you turn turn a knob, you can like increase the instance size for AWS, right? So if you want to see what the uh, the you know move to the next biggest box, you know just turn the knob and. Uh, we can see like performance on the different size boxes using the same workload and stuff. So I think that would be pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. So all kinds of geeky stuff. Always fun. Uh, but I appreciate both of you coming out, hanging out. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I see there's a couple comments from beer on, you know, his desire to, uh, to work for us here. I'll, uh, I'll take a, uh, ping the folks here at Percona about, uh, 
your application, tell them to reach out to you. Also, if you wanted to just drop me a note on Discord, um, our, our Discord is uh, is available, and I'm always on that as well. So um, in case you need the link, there you go, Discord link right there. Um, feel free to uh, grab that as well and uh, join. Um, oh, look at that. Now we've got a question on blockchain for MySQL. I have not seen anything for blockchain um, either. No, have I. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so I think that's something that's uh, potentially coming. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, people want to blockchain the world. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that there, there is some interesting work that I've seen um, in Mongo and some other places because they want to guarantee transactions for security. So it's uh, they, they built it in there. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there is that now, um, Veer, you, you want to know how you can contribute to projects. There's a couple of actual different ways. So obviously, you know, all of the code is available on GitHub. Um, you can uh, push uh, pull requests out there. You can submit bugs. You can submit fixes and patches. So if there are enhancements or things, I would encourage you to do that, to go through that, that channel. Uh, we also have uh, our engineers all on Discord as well. So uh, you can reach out and ask questions and engage there or on the forums. And we'd be happy to have you there. I can't say enough about Discord. If you're not on it, get on it. A lot of good questions get asked. A lot yeah. of good information gets shared. Yeah. And so Oracle did something with blockchain and Oracle 21. So um, I think it's the everything in the kitchen sink. Right. So, we, you know, that that kind of model. Um, I'm, I'm sure that eventually something could show up in, in MySQL. Um, although, you know, if, if Oracle's doing it, they'll probably reserve it for their MySQL service um, or an enterprise version. Um, but that's just my thoughts. I have no inside knowledge on that. That's just, you know, me thinking about it. But all right, everyone. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Next week, we're talking Postgres. Um, hope you uh, show up there as well. And uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, from you guys in the future. So thanks, man. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, man.